there yeah. it is. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate your time this morning. We are here for Mr. Todd Howard. He is running for the City of Claremont City Council. Now, if you have any questions, please do hold them and then write them down on those little placards there and then pass them to the left. He will be giving a short speech about who he is, where he comes from, and well, what he intends to do as a city councilman on there. Uh, apart from that, uh, there's not much to say apart from thank you very much for coming here, Mr. Howard, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you. So first I'd like to say thank you to the Republican Party here in Lake County. They have been super helpful. Um, the support that we've gotten from them, um, I've never seen with other candidates, so I appreciate the new direction that they've gone. And so I think it's a, a great new direction. We called about 300 people last night on the phone bank and had great response. Out of the five pages that I called, uh, nine of mine had already voted for me. I had no, nobody that said they didn't like me and uh, the others we left messages for. So I think we're doing really well. And the great news, everything that the Lake County Republican Party is doing is really helping. So I do appreciate that. That's awesome. Um, for me, I'm Todd Howard. I am a Lake County native. So I was actually born here in Leesburg. Childhood was in Claremont. And then I went to Tavares for elementary, middle, and high school. So I graduated from there. I went on to Lake Sumter Community College and then eventually off to Atlanta to become a chiropractor. And so when I came back, um, after being in a big city, I enjoyed having that. Well, at the time I was young and graduated, uh, our graduating class in Tavares was less than 100 people. And um, Tavares at the time was about 3,500 normal residents, and we'd swell to about 5,000 during snowbird season. So uh, it was a very small town. Uh, you know, the waterfront still had the old packing house on it. There were, you know, it was, Tavares was nothing like it was now. So um, coming back, I was like, oh, I can't do Tavares again. I gotta have a city that's got some amenities to it. So I decided to go back to Claremont. And um, it was fantastic. So I spent 23 years in South Lake practicing. And um, finally, the federal government messed up medicine enough to where I said, I can't do this anymore. So um, still own a boat club, but I retired my license and I walked away from chiropractic. And uh, it was a great decision, so I'm much happier with help having to deal with them. Um, I'm married. I think we're at 20 years now. She's going to be mad because I don't know exactly. <coughs> but, um, so I've been married for about 20 years. We have an 11-year-old son. He's also a product of Lake County Schools. Um, with Claremont, because I own a boat club, we're actively involved in the waterways and making sure that we have enough water as well as clean water for all of us. So. Um, the environment is, is super important to me, not only from my business world, but you know, I'm an avid fisherman. We do a lot of stuff. So um, I love the outdoors. We hunt and fish. So um, being able to do all of that in a clean environment is important. As a business owner, though, the roads, the traffic, the crazy, the crime is something that's a big concern. And what we're starting to run into in Claremont, specifically, is that all of the mess from Orlando is coming over and they're inviting it. We're putting special roads for it, we're building neighborhoods right on the edge over there, and all of those problems, Orlando problems, are now coming to Claremont. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is that Claremont, with its lakes, its downtown, we are a premium community and we don't have to sell to the lowest bidder. We don't have to invite the problems from Orange County into Lake County. And all we have to do is say no to some of these zero lot things with all the, the big apartment complexes and all of that stuff. We can say no. Uh, unfortunately, our city council chooses to continue to say yes, and our roads are deteriorating rapidly. Um, the traffic is horrible. The I, So 27 near Kings Ridge, I don't know if any of you all have ridden on that, um, but I have four windshield cra cracks on my windshield oh. from that. So it, it's completely deteriorated. There's rocks going everywhere. Um, so it, and it's happening to everybody. And so finally they're getting to it, but you know it's kind of too little, too late on a lot of it. So 
we need to get the the city to do a better focus on that. Um, the small business world really struggles. I was talking to a business owner the other day who it's going to be a welcome business, but they're at about five months of dealing with the city to get through all the permitting. No, five sure. months. Red tape. And they're not there yet. So, you know, we need to reduce that. We need to invite our small businesses. And for whatever mm -hmm. reason, the city likes to throw up little roadblocks <coughs> and things. And so, um, you know, we had a roofing company who wanted to expand. They owned a back lot. They just wanted to expand parking to the back lot for their trucks so their employees can come in and park their trucks mm -hmm. and their trailers. And the city really went hard against them and you know I spoke up for them and we had a few others and so we did change the city's mind. But at the time the city was just going to not approve it for a parking. I mean it wasn't doing anything to anybody. They just agree. What was, what was the purpose? Why did they object to it? So it wasn't zoned for that and it wasn't zoned for the parking and the city felt like that they were going to bring semi trucks into it. And the guy's like, I need a place for my staff to park their trucks and their trailers. And so it was just it was just the city not wanting it in there, you know, not in my back. Uh, being difficult on on businesses. Um, there, and then there was the recent 30% tax increase. So there's a gentleman who is a great business owner. Um, he does a lot for downtown, and that tax increase cost him seventy thousand wow. dollars per year. He's well, seventy thousand dollars total. I mean, so it's a you know when when you say that these things don't affect people, it absolutely does because that has now affected his ability <coughs> to develop his properties. Sure. And you know he's a a great job person, you know, he, he gives a lot of jobs, and he's really turned a lot of these buildings into beautiful buildings downtown and throughout the community. Um, so there are repercussions when we do things like that. Uh, I was telling Lou earlier, we just got a 30% water bill increase. And they didn't even try to hide it, they actually did the presentation. And the presentation was, well, we didn't get enough impact fee money from the developers, and we need to build a new sewer system. So in order to bond this, we have to have money coming in somewhere. So we're just going to charge the old residents, increase water bills, we'll bond that, and then we'll pay the debt. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a, and this is how the city has been run. And unfortunately, they just, there's no common sense there. Um, a few months ago, they decided that they were going to pave. There's one last piece of the waterfront that the city owns, and it's a buildable piece of property. It's worth about $2 million. Beautiful piece of property. They put a parking lot on it. Oh, oh my so, lord. So this is the short-sightedness, that they could have sold that property, $2 million, and put it back on the tax rolls, yet they chose to put a parking lot on it. So, you know, and that's, those are kind of the reasons that I chose to run, is that these decisions just don't make sense, and they've allowed the city manager, you know, the job of the city council is to build the sandbox and tell the city manager, here's where you're at, go do what we want you to do. In Claremont, it works the other way. It's the tail that wags the dog. He says, here's what I want, and they just vote for it. And um. so the residents have been completely blocked out. Um, a resident the other day brought forth a bunch of vandalism and some used condoms. The mayor's response was, I've lived here a long time, I can go find condoms on just about any street around here. It's always happened in Claremont. And that's from the mayor. You know, so if the level of ineptitude at, at leadership in Claremont is just it's just sad. And so I, that was one that took me back that, you know, how can you say this about our community? And so we need to turn that around. And the gentleman who's running against me, um, he's a nice guy and does a lot for the community. He owns a nonprofit. Um, a nonprofit that makes no money. So, not a great business guy, but hey, he likes to go around and volunteer to do things. Problem is, is that he's also a horrible person. 
And so one of the local watchdogs down there found out about it and posted it all up. And um, you know now the city wanted this guy to go in there because he's best friends with the mayor. So it tells us what kind of people they are. Uh, and now they want to bring more of those people onto there, so they'll rubber stamp it. And um, luckily, the, the community has found out. And I think we're going to do really well with this election. But uh, we've got to turn it around. We've got to stop allowing people who do not have the best interest of our residents. Because at the end of the day, we are responsible to the residents, mm -hmm. to the folks who vote us in. The residents are not responsible to the city. Part of the thing, the backstory on the vandalism and the condom, the lady who actually documented it was so scared to go through the city council, she gave it to one of the other watchdogs <clears throat> because she felt that she would face, her and her family would face repercussions. Mm. Once she got up there and the lady watchdog who presented it, um, and they just brushed it away. And so it, it kind of, it reinforced the fact that the city just doesn't care. And they don't want to hear, oh, I don't like this. And so, you know, it's unfortunate. But at the end of the day, I think we're going to be a positive voice and we'll make a difference not only in Claremont, but throughout Southwick. And so that's the important part is, you know, with, with Claremont being the largest community mm -hmm. in Lake County, yeah. the direction that we go is going to determine the direction that the other cities go. That's it's right. going to determine the direction that the school board goes. It's going to determine the direction that the BB, BCC, the Board of County Commissioners, goes. So <clears throat> this is an important turning point, and that's part of the reason that Anthony Sabatini wanted to get as involved as he has been in this race, mm -hmm. is because this is the point that we have to put our foot down and say, enough. Yep. And Absolutely. if we can take control of this, then we can say, you know what, we're going to stop it. And we can show what the Republican brand is about. Small government, fiscal responsibility. And so we can stop with all the silliness and the nonsense and, you know, all the, the throwouts to whatever social issue of the day is going on and that's a lot of what goes on there and so for me i want to focus just on the business of claremont the rest of it stay out go go do whatever i don't care but we need to fix our city and concentrate on the core functions of government you know, sounds like it, it so like i mean we need to make sure our roads and our economy are working think about somebody who has to drive from one end of Claremont to the other, it can take 30 minutes to an hour to get across Claremont now. Yeah. Yeah. That is a major, yeah. Yeah. you think about that's yeah. a major economic hit to everybody who's there. So these construction workers who have, you know, three or four guys in a truck that takes an hour from their shop to their job site, well, you know, that's four labor hours but there and back. Now we've got eight labor hours. So he paid a guy all day basically to do nothing is essentially what had happened. Wow. And so, you know, we need people who are going to look at those things and say, hey, you know, how can we make this better? And we don't have any business owners on that city council who look at it and say, hey, how would I look at this from an economic standpoint? And how would I fix it and make it better yeah. for our residents and for businesses? And so that's, that's where I think we can make a difference. What's the name of your boat company? Carefree Boat Club. So, I'll talk about that too. <laughs> so we've been in business for seven years. Um, it was my exit strategy, as I said. Um, when, when Obamacare and other things came in, um, I was really disenchanted. At first, I thought, "Oh, this will be fine, and I'll, you know, I'll survive it. I'm never leaving this profession." I love being a chiropractor. Yeah. The longer and longer and longer it went, and the more and more and more federal government fingers that got stuck in there, it eventually became that I wasn't really practicing much. I was filling out a lot of paperwork. Mm -hmm. And I became more of a billing person mm -hmm. of how to fill out the paperwork correctly so that I could get reimbursed mm -hmm. than I became a person who treated patients. Yeah. And that has happened across the board. And what it's done is it's consolidated more and more medical offices 
under a hospital umbrella or under big multinational companies mm -hmm. because they have that expertise <coughs> to do it. So now they line that doctor up and he just, you know, patient, 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 patient. Yeah. They have somebody else doing all of the other parts of it, a whole staff that does that. And that's what you've seen, and I'm sure all of you have seen yeah. the changes in medicine. And well, they so, don't want to support any alternative medicine at all. They want to support the drug companies. And that's, that's the thing. I was really I accepted in a mainstream medicine. I was reasonable. I didn't step on other doctors' toes. So I did a lot of DOT physicals. I was a federally certified medical examiner for the, for the federal government. Uh, and I worked with a lot of pain management and orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons. And so I had a really good reputation, and people knew what to expect from me. The hard part was that they just are running the sole practitioner, the one we grew up with where you have a family doctor where you can go in and say, hey doc, here's what's going on. Yeah. They're running them out of business. And, yeah. and more and more it's going, it's going to consolidate. Yeah. And when I started practicing, I wanted to practice for myself, not for somebody else. Right. And so that is, that is sort of how the boat club came about, as I was looking at it, I said, you know what, I need an action strategy. I love to fish and I love boats. There you go. So, I do too. Here comes my boat club. Yeah. Then I learned that you should never, ever, ever invest in your hobby. Because you don't get to do your hobby anymore. That's true. <laughs> That's true. It yeah. turns into work. So, That's absolutely right. But I blame it on my kid too. So uh, we, Sebastian came along right around the time, and when he became a toddler, we couldn't put him on boats anymore because he has zero fear. So he climbs up <laughs> in the water. Oh, just, so um, he's now big enough to where we can take him out. So I get to do more of it now. Um, so I can't blame it all on the business. Yeah. Um, but yes, it is always one of those. They say, "Do what you love." I was like, "I'm going to go do what I love." Well, now I don't get to do it eleven. That's, well. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, right. That's right. Um, but it's still great, it, and it's fun, and we get to do the waterways. And so I'm in Claremont, I'm in Tavares, and the Crystal River, and I'm in Canal. So I get to oh, do a nice. lot of driving too. Nice. Um, but the communities have been great, and um, you know I like working with each one of them. They're all distinct and different. Uh, and you know the waterways, the Harris Chain. I grew up on the Harris Chain, and it was such a great way to grow up in tune with the water. Then I go away to college. When I came back, the Harris Chain was wrecked. And so in the six years, seven years that I was gone, I came back and all of a sudden it was pea soup green. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what happened here? Where, you know, I've been gone and I didn't know. And so, you know, I know that they've done a tremendous amount of work about getting it back under control and the bass fishing's back and all of that stuff. So it's, you know, it's great to see how much work they've done to clean up. Um, like Apopka and, and all of the tributaries coming into the chain, uh, but it's you know it, it's a great community, not only here but in South Lake, and um, you know our water in South Lake is super important because we actually feed the Harris Chain, mm. so our water starts all the way up in the what's called Big Creek and Little Creek, um, but anyway the Green Swamp feeds and Lake Louisa goes all the way through our chain up through the Tlacalaha into uh, Lake, Lake Paris. And so it's a, you know, we are all tied together on the, on the water issue. And so for you guys to have clean water in your chain, mm -hmm. in Tavares, um, you know, we need to clean up, we need to make sure ours is, and ours is a designated as outstanding Florida waterway. So the Environmental Protection Agency does not play around. They, they actually have monitors out there and they make sure that everything's going good. Um, and then what they've done with, with Lake Apopka is simply amazing. That water that comes from Lake Apopka, if you ever get to go see it come it across, was, it it's really clear. Bad. I mean, it's uh -huh. crystal clear coming out oh, of there. Wow. And all the, all the work that they've done to run that through the mitigation system, um, the fish are now edible again. So those of you who don't know, Lake Apopka is the most polluted lake mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. The country? Yeah, it was bad. Oh, wow. It was really so bad. It was, it was insanity when, yeah, so they had all the muck farms over there and there's just so much pollution that went on. So when alligators start dying, you know things are bad. Because oh, yeah. <laughs> they're dinosaurs. Yeah, so, oh. so when the dinosaurs aren't yeah. doing good, things are not well. Yeah, so, that's right. Um, so they've brought that back. The fish are now edible. Um, they've cleaned a lot of the, the muck and the stuff out. And so what they do is they run all that water through a plant basin 
and that plants absorb all of the stuff in it and then sends it back in. And so, um, you know, it's taken decades, but we're finally getting there. So, mm, that's um, awesome. Well, we said I would never eat fish out of any of the fish. Um, certainly. Well, so I, you guys know a lot about me now, and yeah. if you guys do have any questions, I am happy to take them. Okay, guys, write down your questions. Oh, okay. So uh, we'll start off the questions, and it seems like, sir, you have garnered quite a few of them, so maybe you shouldn't have been so descriptive about you. But... <laughs> oh, Vance will get you in. Oh, tomorrow. yeah, Vance yeah. will get you on there. Yeah. See, Vance knows me, knows my history, so he might pull something out of, out of yeah. the hat. Good, good. good. But, uh, so we are going to start off with a, the first question that we had. So this one is about everyone's favorite subject, taxes. Yes. So. Uh, your palm card points out that Claremont's tax rate was low for a great many years. Given the recent increases in taxes and fees, do you think that the taxes were kept artificially low for too long? Or what is your explanation for them suddenly increasing? There? No. Um, so we had competent management through those years. The problem that we ran into is that with the new city manager, he had other ideas. So when he presented this, the actual tax increase that he presented was 45%. Oh, so Jesus. he just wanted to go spend more money. Um, and then when they passed the 30%, like John Drury. <laughs> when they passed the 30%, he said, oh, we're going to have to come back to the well next year. Well, residents have lost their minds, and so they, he knows that he can't do that, otherwise he loses his counsel that's willing to rubber stamp everything he does. So um, they have not brought that back. But that's how the water increase came up, was because they were scared to come back for taxes, so they don't have to advertise a water increase. They can just do that themselves and bond it and send it out. So it was nothing more than a water. It was nothing more than a tax increase. Um, but to Vance's question, there was some mismanagement by the city. They so every three years or so, you need to do an impact fee study. Where are our impact fees? Our developers paying what they should pay. Our city chose not to do that for 10 years. Oh my gosh. Through all of the increases for 10 years. So building costs almost doubled in the time that they had done that. So we were collecting less than half of what we should have from them for a good many years. Wow. And uh, so just horrible management of the city level. Um, but taxes did not need to be raised. We did show them how they could balance their budget and we could move forward. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so this next one actually does go into a little bit of uh, a conversation about what happens for that. So on the transparency of the city council and of Claremont in general, there are no meeting videos that exist of the uh, meetings for that. So there's no recordings to tell the public what is going on with it. Will you work to get city council and uh, meetings that are just held in the confidence of Claremont actually on video and posted <coughs> on to the YouTube for the public to obviously scrutinize and understand what is happening there instead of having to rely on either hearsay from someone that was able to be there or just in uh, written out form. Yeah, because Tavares has it on. Yes, 100 percent. So South Lake TV does record a lot of the meetings. They can't get to all of them. However, all of our meetings should be, should be recorded so that when we have a question, we can go back and say, well, did they say this or, you know, so a lot of times politicians like to say one thing behind closed doors and then do another. And as far as I'm concerned, what I say is what I'm going to do. And, you know, I'll take the bumps and bruises for doing what's right. And when I was on school board, we had to balance an $80 million decrease in our spending, and we did. And people got mad about it because we had to move their cheese. That's just part of what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had to do $80 million in cuts. And that is a, it was a problem for a lot of people. People were mad at us because we had to cut stuff. But we didn't have the money to pay for it. So, you know, it was just where we were at. And I get that. People don't like it, but you know, at some point you do have to balance your budget. So. Okay. Thank you very much, sir, for that. All right, so the next one is uh, in relations to annexations and development, as you discussed earlier. 
So what will you do to reduce or possibly limit the impact of growth until infrastructure like roads, schools, and utilities are expanded first to handle the growth of these facilities and the population that will come with them? So this is a, this is a multifaceted issue. Um, one of our biggest challenges right now is Old Claremont's built out for the most part. We've got some infill, but there's not a lot of land left in, in what most people consider Claremont. Highway 50, 27, there. Um, but running down 27 further south, where Wellness Way is, we were made a lot of promises on that. And we were told that the jobs would come before the houses. Well, I can tell you now that's not what's happening. So you know, we were told that there were going to be high skill, high wage jobs put into Wellness Way and that we were going to bring in the housing to support that. Well, we're bringing in the housing and we haven't seen any jobs. And so we need to just stop annexing and improving those developments until we see the jobs. There's plenty of, there is plenty of home residences in Claremont. Yes, they're expensive. We're a premium the community, and that's okay. We don't have to go build cheap cookie cutter developments just to pile people in there so developers make money. That's we don't have to do that, and we shouldn't. We need to insist on high quality community residences that meet what we want as a as a community. Nobody wants a bunch of high rises and and a, you know apartment complexes. There's nobody in Claremont who wants that. I've never heard a single resident say, can I have an apartment next to my house? No. That's right. Yeah. Um, what we want is we want what we already have. That's why we moved to the community. We want to see the hills. So they just did, this is kind of the insanity, and this goes into how do we stop overdevelopment. We had a large multi-family that wanted to go in and because of our hills it limits the way that you can develop some of these properties so we have a rule in place to limit that development that you have to leave a certain amount of the hills you can only cut so much for making the hills flat so you can put your building on it well in our infinite wisdom at the city council they chose to give them an extra 20 feet twice the height of the ceiling of cut and fill. So they could flatten that whole little hill and put a five-story apartment complex on it. Where they couldn't have done that if they wouldn't have, if they would not have allowed the cut and fill. So part of what we run into is the city council just wanting to give everything to the developers. So we can't stop every development, but we can limit them and make them do what we want. Our, QR codes, and that's what we should be doing. Yeah. Wonderful, sir. Thank you very much. And this one actually goes right into that. We're trying to keep trying to keep a good chain going on this one. So, for business development, what will you do to expand the business growth in Claremont to actually fulfill the needs that are actually there first before they move in? And once you expand the climate for work and home, including internet creations, which would reduce commuting loads. So, what will you do just for the infrastructure once you get the business in there? So as we, you know, we've seen post-COVID that more and more people don't have to be places. So my nephew works for FDOT, and he's an engineer who does a lot of the roads around here. As a matter of fact, this is part of his district. And he doesn't have to, he's got his laptop, he does his work, and for the most part, he can do it from home. His biggest issue was there wasn't enough bandwidth for him to upload big giant CAD files over to DLAM. So he was driving back and forth every day. So it's the infrastructure that we need to make sure that we have in place and we can support that. Um, Define infrastructure. By moving into making sure that we have our cable or whatever the next thing is as far as um, being able to supply internet and connectivity to those businesses. So there's only so much bandwidth when we get into fiber and all of that stuff. And so we need to make sure that we have all of that in place. Um, as we move into, and this is getting way ahead, 
as we move into drones. So we have our local Walmart has a pilot program where they're flying drones, they're taking packages and flying them. The city doesn't have a policy on drones. We've got people flying them around commercially. And so as we get into this and people do more and more things from home and we do more and more of this, oh, I can send this from point A to point B, we need to make sure those are done. Um, roads, of course, are super important. We need to make sure that people can get off the exits quickly. You know, if, if you've driven down the turnpike and got caught in that Ocala traffic, mm -hmm. the problem with Ocala is not the turnpike, it's that they're not getting the people off the roads right. onto their surface streets. Mm -hmm. And so we need to make sure that we're working with the turnpike. And the other road entities to help move that traffic along. And we have to do our part as well. Mm -hmm. Being able to keep people off of, you know, allow traffic on 15 and 27, but having access roads to get to businesses so that, you know, we don't have people who are trying to go shopping and do that stuff. So we can move them off of that. Um, you know, it's, you can get into a lot on the infrastructure side, but the primary part is going to be the roads and the business climate. And if we can allow our businesses who are brick and mortar to process through quickly, then it's better for them. I mean, there's no reason to have somebody wait four, five, six months to open their doors. They're losing money every single day. Yep. And it's just tied up in in stuff. They're paying rent, they're paying electric, they're paying, you know, they're already paying a ton of bills, paying for staff, insurance. And, you know, they're not making a dollar because city wants to drag their feet over silliness. So, you know, that's the other part of, of that as well. Can I expand on that mm -hmm. and ask about industrial business growth? I mean, uh, you know, just helping small business like coffee shops and everything isn't where you want to go. You want to go towards uh, uh, getting a large industrial base in there and or uh, administrative buildings for regional headquarters, for companies, that sort of thing. Are you even involved in that, or you just let the county uh, um, uh, department that handles uh, those kinds of things go on their own? So this, to this point, the city's really allowing, so especially in the wellness waste sector, most of that was done by Sean and the BCC. And we signed on to a MOA agreement, you know, so we said, okay, we under, you know, memorandum you know, of understanding. Here's what we're going to do, and basically they set up everything, and we just said okay. So now we annex those parts in. So it's kind of put into place. However, if you go over there, one of the things that you'll see, it's called Hunt Industrial Complex, and this is sort of what Vance is talking about. There's a Hunt Industrial Complex, and so it's not for your largest manufacturers, it's for the small to medium manufacturers. A great complex, and again, it's multifaceted. So you have all of the warehouses and the building area, and then they have an area that's set aside where they can go have meetings, conference rooms, all of that stuff. So um, for those folks who cannot afford, you know, a hundred thousand square foot building, and you know, to be in Christopher C. Ford Park, this is where they start. And we do need more of those incubator type and Hunt Industrial was, was one of those. It just recently sold, but it was owned and operated by a local family and what, did a fantastic job. And we need to target more of those. And you know that's where a lot of that job creation will start. And a lot of entrepreneurs will be able to say, okay, this is, this is where I start. And the large pieces, they're in place and we'll see what comes. But that's more of a county level um, yes, we can invite them, but to this point, the county has been the one that's been on the forefront of bringing them in. Are they doing a good job? Well, I haven't seen any open yet, besides mm -hmm. Olympus is the only one that's coming in. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's one where, you know, we have to work with the BCC to do that. Um, and I've got a good relationship with most of the members on there. Um, a few of them I don't know. Um, I've been out of politics for a while. Um, but you know, it's, we can reach out and we can work together and you have to be the squeaky wheel sometimes. And so, wellness way I tend to be the squeaky wheel. 
Uh, I don't like the direction it's going. I think that um, we've done some foolish annexations. We've done some foolish building, um, and we need to fix those. But uh, what they've already done, I can't stop. But we can be the squeaky wheel to say, hey, we're not going in that direction. You said it was this. We're not going to give you bonus. Here's some bonus um, points. So now you can build 500 homes instead of 300 homes. And that's a lot of what's built in there, is that there's these little bonuses. Oh, you know, if you give us a little grease over here, we'll give it over here. And that's not OK. Can I just? What you are getting into there, though, is the idea that it is a double-sided coin. The industry will not place itself in an area where there is not housing for their workforce. And we have housing, and we have workforce housing. The problem is that the folks who are tied into the workforce housing own a piece of land and they want to put it there. They don't want to put it next to an industrial site. And that's the problem. So one of our workforce housing <laughs> places is on a side street that has no workforce near it. Uh, this happened also with another nonprofit where they wanted to put some workforce type housing out in Bay Lake. I can tell you now, unless you're a cowboy, there are no jobs in Bay Lake. <laughs> so this is the silly <laughs> that we get into is that developers, well-meaning people, want to put a square peg in a round hole. And so, yes, if we have, an, if we have a job center, workforce housing there makes total sense. And then I'm okay with it. But we don't have that. And it's not on the cusp. Well, isn't a lot of what you're talking about with um, housing, we are undercut Speak now. It's, it's, we are undercut by this live locally bill, which they come in and say, this is what we want to put here, and then they tell us we have to do it. So the Live Local Act is... You my question. <laughs> so the, I've got it. So the Live Local Act, um, so the question was about how the Live Local Act is affecting us and the repercussions that, you know, how it's driving our decisions. Um, Tavares just voted against somebody who said we're going to sue you over the Live Local Act. Good for them. Yeah. You know, we're going to have to step up and say no. Um, Mineola is going through it right now. Fortunately, Claremont, Claremont has not had that happen yet, but they approve everything anyway, so they don't have the guts to say no. Um, so when I'm on there, will we? Probably. Uh, you know, we're just going to say no. Uh, the problem is, and you know, Tallahassee is. Tallahassee is Tallahassee. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like i got to go shake the fleas off every time I yeah, go there. Yeah, it's a cluster. <laughs> um, you know, and I know there's well-meaning people up there, but you know, somebody a long time ago said, for every bill, there's a group behind it. There's a special interest that puts yeah. it. So there is nothing that's going on in Tallahassee that there's not a special interest behind. Yep. So <clears throat> in general, and I'm not, you know, I don't want to disparage any of of our party folks, but for the most part, the stuff that they put out there has a group behind it, has a special interest. You know, yeah, there's some that put something out, you know, because they fully believe in it, and that's great. Mm -hmm. But those typically are going to die, you know, committee. before they even get in committee. They're like, oh, well, you know, you don't have any support for this, and we're not going to run through. We gotta, we've got more important priorities. And so that's the unfortunate part. But the, you know, we just need to really be on our legislators in Tallahassee to curtail this, similar to what you're talking about. If there is a job center within a radius, then you can do the local collect. But to tell a small community, especially like Claremont, that we're going to build 800 homes, you're going to get zero tax revenue for 20 years on this. Mm -hmm. Now we can't. You can't expect a city to function under that kind of silliness. You just can't. And so I don't know how it got passed. There's a special interest somewhere that did it. 
the problem is, is that, so yes, I agree. Um, are we afraid of it? Are we aware of it? Sure. Um, but we just have to say no, and we have to go to the folks in Tallahassee and say, listen, you need to put the brakes on this. Sunset it or put some parameters, some, some reasonable parameters that we can work around. But giving somebody free run with no oversight on what you want to build, so you can build a five-story building wherever you want, you can't, you know, that's just not okay. And it doesn't fit the community in, so um, at the end of the day, as Republicans, <coughs> we believe that government closest to you is the best government. Mm -hmm. So having Tallahassee give us a one-size-fits-all for every community, whether it's Claremont, Umatilla, I mean, we couldn't be any more different in our size. So, you know, somebody wants to go put out a giant workforce housing, you know, 800 units, 1,000 units in Umatilla with no taxes. I mean, who's going to pay for all of their city and their water and, you know, who's going to, all the connections and the infrastructure and all the stuff that goes with it in sewer? <coughs> you just can't do those types of things. So it's unfortunate that we're at that position, but yes, we've got to stop it. And we just have to say no. Yes. And so kudos to Tavares for being the first in Lake County to say, no, we're going to We'll go to court. Let's go. Okay. So uh, there's a next question on there. Have you heard anything about the Cross Barge Canal? Apparently this was an older issue that came up about 20 years ago, but has recently resurfaced because of the Live Low Act. Well, that's you, not here. That's not up here. north. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Well, that okay. was brought up as well, a question. Well, I just heard it, and I just thought that it was... <laughs> going to, I think it was years ago they cut it off because it would cause saltwater intrusion into our uh, aquifer. So the, yeah, so I don't the, care. We, it drains yeah. south. Right. So the, the Cross Florida Barge Canal will never happen. Good. Um, it's just, it's not a possibility. Uh, the only discussion that there really is, is the, there is a dam up there. Rotterdam? Um, anyway, there's a dam up there that some folks want to take out, and it would, you know, it was put in there for flood control. Um, the locals say they don't need it anymore, and that it would give um, better use of the lake area without the dam. So maybe some of that comes out, but that was part of the, as they did that, that was part of the flood control. So because the barge canal is not going to come through, they don't need that dam. So will that go away? Maybe. Um, you know, that That's one that the environmental the really smart environmental people can fight that out. Um, it, it's you know when you get into those those minute details, that's above my pay grade. So I know we thank you for the honesty and candor of it. So actually, speaking of the environment, so for the lakes, what do you intend on supporting or doing to help clean up the lakes? Obviously, you said that it's doing pretty well and we're covering pretty well in there. What would you like to do to actually encourage that further or to just make sure they're preserved in general? So for the lakes, um, we have a lot of invasive plants, and we need to have a concentrated effort to remove those invasive plants and to encourage our grasses to grow. So the natural grass that you see, that's what should be there. Um, unfortunately, we get a lot of the invasives, and then um, we just don't deal with them properly. So part of the way that Harris Chain got so messed up, when I was a kid, the part off of Lane Park Road that whole area was covered in lily pads. And they fly a plane across it, and they spray it all, they kill it. And so this started setting forth that process where now we've got all this decaying material and the oxygen changes and the fish die. And so you get into this, this kind of negative feedback cycle where it feeds on itself and then it messes up the entire ecology of the lake and it crashes. Chemicals. And yeah, so, and we've seen that multiple times. So we're smart enough now to where we know we don't want to do it anymore. Um, I have a friend who it runs the um, Indian River Restoration Group. And so same thing happened over there. It went, it went, it went. And then there's freezes that we had in 2011. Everything had already deteriorated so much. And then we had those, those freezes that came along well, it was so close to flipping, it was the freeze that turned it over. So, and it just destroyed all of the grasses, and so that's where you hear all the manatees and all of that stuff having an issue. 
Um, so it, it's, we lower, it's the immune system, we lower the immune system of these things until we have a, a event that shouldn't cause it, but it does, and it completely destroys it. And it's just because we reached the straw that broke the camel's back. And, but we're getting smarter on that now. Hey, this is Vance. And uh, normally I don't talk about the video of elected candidates, but I'm here at the Lake County Republican Party headquarters. We just interviewed Todd Howard, who is running for city council for uh, Claremont. And I just want to say, since he's the only Republican running, uh, he has an incredible depth of answers for almost every question we asked. And uh, he's been endorsed by the Lake County Republicans. And he should be really considered uh, for Claremont voters to support. So go out and vote. So be sure to go out and vote for Todd Howard for uh, Claremont City Council.